No, poor you may begin. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, to whoever is watching this stream. Um, this is the AI on the ground approach tutorial. And I'll just take um, the first few minutes to tell you why we decided to do this. Um, and I'll introduce myself and the panelists who are going to speak today. It is a low interaction session, but we're sort of doing a process of thinking aloud based on our research processes and what we've sort of learned through our respective computational ethnographies. So just a quick introduction about myself. I am Nupur. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the AI Now Institute at New York University. Uh, and I study numerous different things. In my past research, I've looked at the gig economy and algorithmic management and issues of labor and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, in my current role at AI Now, I um, look at information systems broadly, uh, especially in the global south, and try and uh, adopt an ethnographic approach to understand uh, how, inf how existing information systems and digitization are affecting um, people's lives on a daily basis and governance processes and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to now invite all the speakers to introduce themselves um, in the order of Radhika can go first and then Vidushi and then Ranjit. Radhika, would you like to just give us a short introduction? Thanks, Nupur, and hi to everyone who is watching. I'm Radhika Radha Krishnan. I'm a gender studies researcher in India. Uh, I currently work at the Internet Democracy Project, which is a nonprofit uh, that works at envisioning feminist ways of looking at the internet and data. Um, my background is in uh, computer science engineering and gender studies. So I try to work at the intersection of these fields. So I use qualitative ethnographic approaches to understand particularly uh, women and queer communities experiences with and engagement with uh, technologies, uh, especially emerging technologies such as AI. And I try to use an explicitly feminist perspective and lens when I analyze uh, data-driven interventions in India, um, and I've so far particularly looked at the healthcare space, um, but I'm really looking forward to also working in other domains with uh, similar perspectives. Vidushi. Hi everyone, I, I'm Vidushi Martha. I am a senior program officer at Article 19, um, which is an international human rights organization um, that wants to ensure that people have the freedom of um, expression and information around the world. Um, I lead our work on artificial intelligence, um, and my focus is on the intersection of artificial intelligence and human rights. Um, for the past four years, I've focused on trying to understand how AI systems are designed, developed, deployed, and standardized in um, global South contexts in particular. Um, and some of our research has included, um, you know, producing academic research on New Delhi's predictive policing system, looking at smart sanitation in Pune, um, looking at, we're currently looking at smart cities in um, Myanmar, um, and we recently published a report on emotional recognition technologies in China. Um, so we look at different jurisdictions, but I think we're, we're taking a decidedly on the ground approach to how we ask questions and how we um, come up with recommendations. And I'm excited to learn um, from all of you today. Thanks for having me. I'd like to invite Renji. Thanks, Rupur. Uh, hi, my name is Ranjit. I am a postdoctoral scholar at uh, Data and Society Research Institute. I work with the AI on the ground team there. So uh, the name of the tutorial kind of uh, rings really well with me. Uh, I have done my dissertation research on India's biometric based national identification infrastructure, ARCAR. I was interested in looking at how the number becomes a new condition for uh, securing citizenship rights in the country. So I explicitly focused on how the number got increasingly connected with welfare. And uh, over the span of the last couple of years, I have been following uh, the Aadhaar controversy specifically in India. But at the same time, uh, now that I am working at Data and Society, my focus has, been, has become broader where I'm trying to actually look at how people experience, um, you know, AI-based interventions, machine learning, 
uh, and just the experience of the in, uh, in, uh, information technologies more broadly in the global south. Uh, and along these lines, we have uh, we are working on a project which is kind of centered on uh, mapping a conceptual vocabulary of how people talk about AI in the global south. Um, and uh, along these lines, um, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, you know how our different experiences actually uh, speak to that particular issue today. Thank you. There are numerous reasons why we thought that doing something like this is important, but just as Ranjit said, uh, the Data and Society Institute uh, already has a program fleshed out, which is called AI on the ground approach. And we've also seen a lot of people sort of take interest in and start thinking about how do you study AI on the ground or what does it mean to study AI on the ground. And so we wanted to assimilate some of those approaches, but also do um, some thinking based on our own attempts at studying AI in the field or on the ground and come up with both uh, learnings or realizations we've had, as well as some open questions that we want to now pose back in the hope that we can really build a community around this, which isn't just using uh, the grounded approach um, as a sort of obvious commonsensical and catch-all term, but rather sort of start attending to the problems or the differences and divergences that arise when one starts um, studying something like emergent AI systems on the ground. It just so happens that we're also all of us studying AI on the ground in different Global South contexts. So we definitely also want to speak from that perspective. Having said that, I want to invite Radhika to now give her talk and just tell us about what she's been researching and um, the, the lessons that she has. Thanks, Nupur. Uh, so I'm going to actually begin by contextualizing some of the research that I work upon so that it gives uh, all the viewers uh, some sort of insight into where I'm coming from and where I'm positioned uh, when I approach uh, the challenges that I will be speaking about today. Uh, so as I said earlier, I work uh, from within a gender studies perspective and I work uh, primarily within the healthcare space. So I try to understand how women engage with emerging tech such as AI and uh, how you know these experiences are something that can uh, be contextualized and also inform policy. Uh, so in Indian healthcare, a lot of the data-driven interventions, uh, they're often introduced in quite remote uh, and rural areas uh, because these areas have a shortage of medical expertise. And uh, AI systems are uh, now being introduced as a sort of panacea for that labor shortage. Uh, so, for example, I've done ethnographic research uh, on AI-enabled medical diagnosis systems, which use AI to automate medical diagnosis decisions in places where doctors are often not available. Um, and this context is important so that you can visualize the, uh, to some extent the field that I'm talking about and what these uh, fields look like. So my ethnographic sites are um, generally in semi-rural or rural India. Um, and therefore, uh, a, a, traditionally, it would be called what uh, we uh, what we say as studying down. Um, but I have also combined my ethnography with the approach of studying up. Uh, everything is in quotes uh, because I'm also interested in looking at the people and institutions which uh, design the technology, which fund the technology, and the spaces where this technology is actually implemented. So I want to look at uh, all the ends of uh, of this particular process of this uh, of creating this, um, and I look at the private space as well as the public space. Um, and so in uh, in my presentation today, I will try to touch upon uh, my experiences with all of these. Um, and I really want to focus on the methodological challenges that I have faced in the field. Uh, as a researcher uh, doing this uh, and also offer some ways in which I have creatively subversed uh, uh, or negotiated with this space in order to you know, uh, overcome some of these limitations. Uh, and as Nupur introduced at the beginning, this is something that even I'm still thinking out loud. Um, so I don't claim to have answers to uh, all the ways in which this can actually uh, be supported. Uh, but um, hopefully this is a conversation that continues and we can learn from uh, this. 
uh, I also want to write at the forefront position myself as a cis queer, upper caste, able-bodied Hindu woman in India. Uh, and I'm putting this out at the forefront and of course within a gender studies discipline. Uh, and I think that this positioning is really uh, important to uh, the way my experiences have panned out um, and the way I have been able to get or not get access to certain spaces and what uh, kinds of constraints that I have had in those spaces. Um, so with that context in mind, uh, I want to uh, jump into one of the first challenges that I want to talk about today, uh, which is the politics of uh, studying up, which is um, studying the experts. Um, and uh, here I want to focus on the challenges I've had with um, accessing um, firstly private institutions and then I will come to public institutions. Uh, and the stakeholders that are relevant here are, um, as, I, I, as I spoke about the uh, healthcare space earlier, uh, these are developers of AI systems uh, within big tech institutions um, or even startups. Uh, the funders and investors of these systems, uh, the healthcare institutions, uh, such as hospitals, where these systems are tested and uh, deployed. And uh, one major hurdle for doing ethnographic research in these sites is uh, gaining access to these experts. Uh, because when you, let's say, approach um, a data scientist who is working in one of these big tech companies, and uh, it's usually, uh, uh, you know, Global North companies that are building these systems and then deploying them in uh, places like India. Um, and when you're trying to get access to the people who've actually made this technology, uh, they quite conveniently say that they are not authorized to provide any information to us. Um, and this is due to uh, reasons for trade secrets, institutional secrecy, non-disclosure non agreements, uh, and other kinds of liability issues that they don't want to face as individuals. Um, and uh, there are two ways in which I have so far gone about it, and uh, each of them has their own limitations. So one is something that an ethics level committee would advise you to do, which is uh, offer the option of anonymity to the people that you're speaking to. Um, but however, in a context like India, where there aren't that many technology companies that are building this kind of tech in the country, it's quite easy to actually trace back to the people that we've spoken to, and therefore this isn't really a foolproof method. Uh, another thing that usually happens is that individuals often agree to speak to you in the presence of their PR team. Um, and this doesn't really work out very well either because uh, then the conversation becomes very mediated, it's not as authentic, and uh, there are limitations to what really can be discussed in that kind of an engagement. Um, uh, and then there are some challenges to accessing public institutions. Um, and for example, you can take government healthcare facilities as the stakeholder for this. Uh, in India, there is a lot of government bureaucracy um, and if you need to even do ethnography within uh, a public institution for a public funded project, you still require government authorization to do that ethnography. And uh, this authorization is, getting this authorization is a really long drawn process uh, because they make you run from uh, uh, office to office, from city to city. It's a really long process. It takes days or weeks. And, and the reason this is frustrating is not just because you run out of patients, but because this takes funding. If I need to be in the site for weeks just to get the authorization letter before I can even begin my research, that means I need that many extra weeks of funding to be able to stay there. And uh, I will talk about funding a little bit more uh, even later on. But I think that uh, that becomes um, a huge challenge to be able to uh, conduct this kind of research within research within resource uh, strapped organizations and uh, de departments. Uh, so uh, what uh, and, and I want to really also talk about um, how this bottleneck really informs the choices of the methods and fieldwork sites uh, where we go looking for data. Because if uh, there is not enough funding to stay in the field for a long period of time to continue that research, you're forced to then do research and forced to do ethnography in smaller bursts. And that affects the kind of relationships that you can build and maintain with your research participants and others in the field. Otherwise, you have to choose your field in a manner which is closer to your home. 
so that you don't actually have to stay out for longer and you don't need funding uh, for that extra cost. And I think none of those are really uh, particularly ideal, but trade-offs that a researcher has to make in these constraints. Um, or another thing what I have done and worked is that if you want to altogether subvert the government authorization requirement, uh, then I have um, in the past uh, built relationships and friendships with uh, workers in the field, such as union workers, who I have found are particularly helpful sources uh, for giving you data and helping you access spaces that otherwise you would require government authorization for. So uh, these relationships have been really helpful for me. Uh, and I didn't really expect that before getting into the field, but they uh, actually turned out into really important connections for actually uh, accessing other data sources. Uh, other common challenges that I think exist with both private and public uh, stakeholders and domains, um, and this is particularly relevant as a woman studying a male dominated tech field of experts, uh, since the tech field is dominated by cis upper class, upper class men in India, uh, is negotiating the power and establishing expertise in the field. So I have faced instances of sexual harassment, I faced instances of being spoken down to, uh, men mansplaining their technology to me, assuming that I don't understand it. And these are all uh, challenges that are traumatic. They can hinder a researcher from continuing to do this long term. And I don't think that there are uh, enough conversations about these uh, softer aspects of methodology as much as there uh, should be. I also want to quickly flag off two other challenges uh, that I have faced, uh, apart from the politics of studying up as I've described. Uh, the second is the politics of uh, studying down. Uh, so for example, studying patients uh, who are experiencing and engaging these kinds of um, AI-based technologies or on the receiving end of these. Um, and I think that in this case, certain protocols that are traditionally mandated by ethics review committees for such research uh, fail to sometimes capture the actual experiences of the researcher in the field. So for example, informed consent forms, they don't really uh, they don't really work in the way they've been envisioned. If you're talking to someone from a marginalized background about a tech intervention in the field, uh, they are going to be very hesitant to actually talk to you because even though your form says that you will keep their data confidential, you are not going to uh, talk, uh, leak what they've said to their employers, uh, the context is that we're living in a country where these kinds of agreements are flouted on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's very little reason for someone like a daily wage laborer to actually trust me and speak to me. And I think that therefore, even though while consent is really important for doing any kind of ethnographic research and for anything in life, um, I think what consent forms in particular do is formalize consent in a very transactional manner, which does not really work in the field with the realities that you're working with. And I think we need to adopt more feminist critiques that advocate for reimagining the way consent works in the field. Um, and lastly, I'm going to take a minute to talk about uh, the last constraint that I think is important to highlight, which is that of funding and other kinds of resources. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a researcher who works within a social sciences department, such as gender studies. And there is very little funding available within these departments for carrying out especially tech-related research. This is because even though we have seen that the discourse has moved to an extent where we are pushing for ethics and social sciences perspectives within tech disciplines, the inverse is not really happening. So within gender studies departments, we're not actually having much conversations around tech and tech development. One simple example is the fact that uh, during my master's in gender studies, uh, we did not actually have a subject on feminist uh, technology or data studies, but we did have a subject on feminist science studies. So this really uh, limits the kinds of uh, potential that there exists for a deeper engagement uh, with AI and other such tech from within social sciences disciplines, which is really critical when we're talking about something like ethnography, which is native to these kinds of disciplines. Um, so these have been the large 
uh, major challenges that I have faced in the field as a researcher uh, studying AI on the ground and some thoughts out loud on how I've navigated it. But I'm also looking forward to what uh, the other speakers will add to this and any questions or comments that anyone may have that's listening. Thank you. I want to invite Vidushi to speak next, um, but for whoever might be watching us, because we're all on Zoom and we can't see our audiences, um, I just want to flag that we have a slido where you can ask your questions, and then we'll get back to them uh, at the end of the talks. Um, Vidushi, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nupur, and thanks, Radhika, for starting us off. Um, so be before I get into kind of like the learnings and stuff that I, I'd like to share, um, I think contextualizing um, why and how my research came out to be and all of the the, the research pieces that I'm going to talk about, um, why they came to be, I think, is an important uh, piece of framing to to. Um, put um, on the table at the outset. So much of the research that I will be talking about has happened in the last four years. Um, and essentially, the reason that, uh, you know, we took this on the ground approach, um, you know, from 2016, 2017 onwards was that um, at the time, the the field of AI research was kind of like just coming into this, this wonderful <laughs> being that it is uh, as of today. Um, but what we noticed was that there was a lot of compelling evidence for why we needed urgency in the space. But a lot of that evidence was coming from the US and from Europe from very, um, you know, relatively privileged backgrounds um, and privileged contexts. And so while the 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 um, the message for urgency was well taken, it wasn't fully translating and, and being contextualized in jurisdictions that are often, you know, testing grounds for these technologies. Um, so that was kind of the first um, way in which we wanted to bring in social context and, and everyday experiences into the mainstream. Um, and the second, and I think this is perhaps um, the most important bit um, of, of, of much of the research that we do is that a lot of assumptions about infrastructure, a lot of assumptions about what data exists, what uh, you know, operating procedures exist, um, what kinds of access exist, um, you know, didn't really match when we looked at excellent research on predictive policing coming out of the US and Europe. Um, and then when we looked at India, we realized that we were kind of dealing with a completely different culture. Um, and so ethnographic methods became even more important then because we were trying to draw the human daily experience of these systems, um, but we didn't necessarily have the tools for it. So um, I, I wanted to share a couple of, or rather narrate how we went through this change and the challenges that we've gone through, you know, um, trying to do the quantitative research and then actually moving through different challenges to see that ethnographic research was um, perhaps the most valuable tool that we have um, at this current moment. Um, so I'm gonna be drawing from a couple of projects. So one was uh, looking at predictive policing in New Delhi with Shivangi Narayanan. Uh, she's a, a PhD student at, a PhD candidate at um, Jawaharlal Nehru in, uh, Institute in New Delhi. Um, and we've also done some amount of work in Myanmar, looking at Mandalay smart cities and things like that. So there are different contexts from which I am drawing um, many of my learnings. Um, so essentially, I think in the beginning, there was always an, a, like the tendency to say, we want to look at data, we want to look at evidence of harms, we want to look at uh, you know the models, we want to look at um, disparate impact if, if that, kind of data exists and while we did try to do that right at the beginning especially in the new delhi case i think you know we really wanted to see what kind of demographics were being um, unfairly targeted by the delhi police and things like that um, what, what we quickly realized was not only was that data not available to researchers who don't work with the government but we weren't even sure that that data exists um, especially given that a lot of the the technologies that we talk about are in pilot stages so you know assumptions of data um, existing on harms was something that we had to quickly uh, roll back uh, from. Uh, the second thing was that we also wanted to understand, you know, what does responsible use of these technologies look like? Is there such a thing? Um, you know, how are rules uh, followed when it comes to predictive policing in New Delhi? Or, you know, how does procurement in smart cities in, in Myanmar happen? And we also quickly realized that standard operating procedures 
are kind of a luxury often um, you know it's it's the daily uh, tendency of individuals and powerful actors that ends up kind of dictating what the standard operating procedure looks like rather than a document on a notice board somewhere that you can then um, compare and contrast uh, practice with um, and the I guess the last thing was that we realized that institutions, especially in in the kind of fields that I I have been involved in, you know, which is mostly law enforcement and state focused, um, we realized that institutions don't lend themselves to scrutiny, especially not from human rights lawyers um, and institutions that, that don't really have, um, so to speak, like skin in the game with um, with institutions that usually hinge on security and safety as being the exception to being scrutinized. Um, and so what, what became very clear to us was that we were asking questions of what happened, right? So what was the harm? Who was um, harmed? Why? And things like that. But we weren't asking how it was happening. So we weren't asking how does this become normalized? Why is this, um, you know, like we weren't thinking about the root causes, but we were looking for evidence that emerged from those root causes. Um, and so we essentially flipped the script to say that we're not going to focus on getting data on how many people have been arrested because a that's not um that's not available to us um but also b we want to figure out what the the structural and the um, root causes of these problems were and so we started thinking about you know what kind of assumptions become rhetoric within institutions so um, you know, whether it's when, when we're thinking about smart cities, the fact that biometrics are perfect technologies that will only be scary if you're a criminal, right? Where does that get written into practice? Where does that get written into policy? How does um, one decide that facial recognition works perfectly, right? So where, where do those assumptions come from? Who are the actors that are pushing for that? Um, how does it come to be taken as a given? How does it come to be part of institutional culture? Um, but then also assumptions around, you know, for instance, with predictive policing, looking at um, how do you assume that certain demographics are more inclined to be uh, criminals like how does that actually happens because we know that it does happen obviously we have evidence of that from around the world we see discrimination with all you know we're, we're from societies that have a legacy of discrimination so we know it exists um, but the question was really like how does it come to be normalized in institutions so for instance in the Delhi police um, work that we did we found that often there were proxies so if um, it, it was um, essentially um, an emergency call center that we were looking at. So, you know, people call and say this this thing is like we've had an inst in instance of snatching in some part of Delhi and then it gets marked up and that becomes part of the layer um, that that kind of predicts uh, you know, crime, crime rates and crime um, probabilities in Delhi. And so we started figuring out that like, if there were calls from poorer neighborhoods, they weren't taken as seriously as calls from affluent neighborhoods. If someone called from an affluent neighborhood and said, my, my purse got snatched, it was often mapped to the poorer neighborhood because the assumption is that rich people would not make, uh, you know, rich people would not snatch purses. So you just mark the nearest ghetto. Um, we saw similar things around religious lines. We we saw that um, um, high risk areas were often proxies for bars as well. Um, and so those kinds of learnings, while not exactly surprising, were extremely valuable for us in assessing what that system would look like, right? So, or, or how that system functions in practice. Um, and so a lot of um, a, a lot of our learnings has has come from essentially flipping that script to say we're going to focus on how things happen on a daily basis and then kind of move away from this need for evidence and rather like look at you know what are the possible outcomes what are the things that we can ex uh, we can expect to happen or um, you know what is the risk and who is that risk posed to um, and so I I wanted to say two more things. One is that um, I want to build on something Radhika mentioned, which was studying up. Um, I think it's really interesting how different studying up has been for both of us, even though we've done similar um, kinds of work, uh, simply because of the, the situation in which we were. Um, you know, I was looking at law enforcement, Radhika was looking at healthcare, and I think it's really interesting in that 
our experience of studying up was more inadvertent than anything. So we were in a position where we wanted all of this data and we wanted all of this access and we couldn't get it. And then we really thought uh, long and hard about how we could derive value from from the position that we were in. And we realized that there was so much to say about the institution. There was so much to say about power. There was so much to say about unchecked uh, power and bureaucracy and things like that. So that's what we ended up doing, which has helped us really understand what the system would look like. Um, whereas, you know, studying up in a context that doesn't necessarily involve state power, but is more private oriented, I think can be can be different from, uh, you know, from what we heard from Radhika. Um, and I think just in general, the 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 tendency to study up, I think, you know, anthropologists have been saying this for years, but especially in the AI context, um, it really allows us to do this thing of flipping the script that I've been talking about through my through um, this intervention. Um, and the last thing um, I wanted to quickly say was that, um, and this is, I don't have an answer to this, but this is something I want to pose, which is most um, jurisdictions that uh, you know, come from a legacy of democracy, for instance, we usually have like a rights based um, approach to thinking about harms. I'm a human rights lawyer, I have the same. So we're often thinking of like, you know, what, what is the harm that's being done? Who is it being done to? And um, especially when it comes to emerging technologies that are like silver bullets and magic, or they're supposed to be magic at least. Um, it's difficult to have that evidence of harm. And it's difficult not only because it's not tangible, but often because it's extremely opaque. And so the question for me uh, at the moment is, how do we move away from this need for evidence of harm, but still kind of preempt some of the dangers that come with this technology? So is it you know, moving towards a more risk-based approach? Is it moving towards um, reverse engineering? I, I don't exactly know the answer, but I think it's worth um, dwelling on because I do think that a lot of research in the next couple of years, especially as we're trying to, you know, preempt harms of technologies as opposed to just point them out, um, it's, it's going to become um, increasingly important. So thanks for listening and I, I look forward to hearing from uh, Ranjit and Nitin. Thank you, Vidushi. Um, since we're on a tight schedule, I am going to go ahead and invite Ranjit to speak. We're just all going to present and then have a short break to collect your questions if you have any and then we'll have a discussion at the end so Ranjit do you want to go next yeah this was great it kind of also sets up what I wanted to talk about as well primarily because the question of how do we identify harms it's something that you know I struggled with when I was looking at uh, India's biometric based national identification infrastructure so to give you some context, you know, India started in 2010 to collect fingerprints and iris scans of everybody in the country to give them a unique social security number. And uh, the number in itself is voluntary and, you know, you're not required to have it. But at the same time, the government has increasingly mandated its use uh, for a variety of welfare services. And, you know, if you need to access social security in India, you need to actually have uh, an Aadhaar number now. So in a way, this particular relationship is not... I would say unique to India in the sense that, you know, whenever the notion of digital welfare states is kind of imagined and how people think about it, uh, we generally have a certain form of identity which is kind of uh, deeply connected with forms of welfare services. And uh, and that is, not a, uh, that is not a bug. I would not say that this is something, this is a problem. I think it's a feature of how, uh, you know, um, these things are operationalized uh, and how the state actually works it out. So now the question then becomes, uh, how do people experience it on the ground? And, uh, you know, and here I'm basically invoking a very broad framing of what I mean by AI. It could simply be a matching algorithm where, you know, you basically enter some data and it is matched to something uh, which is stored in a centralized database. Uh, even that to a certain extent, when it comes to the ground and it's experienced by people when they put their fingerprint on a biometric reader, and they wait for an, uh, for an outcome or uh, an authentication outcome which says whether this authentication worked or not. It kind of translates into an experience of a system that is passing a judgment on them. And that to a certain extent is a form of intelligence or you know, something which is coming from a system towards you. And that experience is something that I'm interested in talking about today. And I'm gonna start with a very simple example of uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, right to food activists who are basically trying to map uh, the implementation of these projects uh, <clears throat> where you know the biometric number was being connected with a distribution of food subsidized food grains in the country 
And it's a story of a small village where there was no network connectivity. So one of the things that this entire village had to do was to literally walk up a hill, do authentication on top of the hill uh, because the network uh, availability was uh, stronger there, then come down from there and then access their subsidized food grains. And in this story, what's important to notice is that, you know, uh, it's not, it's literally walking up a hill in order to actually access uh, your citizenship rights in a way. But at the same time, it's also a way in which we can start thinking about how there is a broader infrastructure that needs to be in place for uh, AI-based systems to actually work. And that to a certain extent then translates into a variety of different issues that, need, that could potentially be unpacked and thought through uh, without uh, having to study up, but simply being uh, in conversation with activists and trying to basically make a sense of how they're actually uh, trying to map uh, these stories that, you know, uh, happen on an everyday basis. Uh, so I kind of was interested in looking at these stories uh, and how do activists go on basically creating evidence for themselves and as well as for, uh, you know, uh, the government uh, in order to think about uh, what are the consequences of using this biometric based authentication system for accessing welfare? And uh, interestingly, when they started this work, and I was I started following them in 2015. So when they started this work of actually looking at it, they were quite enthusiastic about uh, the number itself, primarily because it provides legal identity to people. And legal identity is often used by uh, marginal communities in order to protect themselves from harassment. So uh, there was some amount of enthusiasm around the project, but also there was this particular fear that, you know, connecting it and making it mandatory for welfare is going to have uh, quite a few uh, unintended consequences on the ground. So when they started doing it, they started uh, to think about, uh, okay, what are the consumption patterns and how, how are consumption patterns changing because of the fact that now this number is connected with uh, access to subsidized food grains. Are people eating less? Are they eating differently? And interestingly, uh, as they were trying to map this uh, dynamic, they also kind of realized that it is exceedingly hard to figure out what somebody was eating six months ago uh, and then map it onto what they're eating now and you know, looking at that difference in order to quantify what's really going on on the ground. So over time, uh, there were a lot of stories and a lot of discussions on how do we actually put together these anecdotes into ways of accounting for how these systems are changing the way in which people experience technologies as well as citizenship. And uh, the, the final strategy that kind of started working a lot better for the activists was when the news broke of uh, uh, a six-year-old girl who died of hunger because uh, she, her family did not have Aadhaar-based uh, identity documents to access welfare. Uh, and that, to a certain extent, then became this uh, rallying uh, event around which right to food activists started uh, documenting hunger deaths that are happening in India because of people not having access to their uh, social security because of authentication troubles or information troubles of one sort or the other. So that, to a certain extent, became an organizing principle around which, you know, a lot of the documents that were created. And these were basically based on media stories. They were personal field, uh, you know, uh, field work that, you know, the activists themselves were doing. And you will notice that, you know, these sorts of go uh, Google documents, and I have noticed this in the last couple of years, have kind of exploded in the context of Aadhaar. There are uh, Google Docs that map stories on Aadhaar-based fraud. There are Google Docs that map uh, stories on uh, Aadhaar-based data leaks. There, there are Google Docs that map hunger deaths that are happening in welfare schemes. So in, it's, a, it's a new grassroots way of collecting data on what's really happening because of these systems. And I find that to be an interesting way of thinking about what are the consequences of these technologies, how uneven they are, and how do they actually work out in practice. So I'm going to keep it short and just talk about this. Thank you. No good. Uh, thank you, Ranjit. Uh, so I'm going to also keep it a short presentation, mostly because I I want to be responding to some of the things that people have raised. Um, but I'll try and begin with some of my own experiences as a researcher uh, and the questions that animate my uh, participation in this particular tutorial. I think coming again from a global South context, which happens to be the majority of the world, by the way, um, one of the important primary questions that came to me when starting to study AI through qualitative methods broadly is, where do you locate AI? 
And I feel like coming from the Global North Academy, like being situated in a US university and reading a lot of research that right now is uh, very important and very trendy in terms of thinking about, oh, this is how you study AI or, you know, this is the ethnographic approach and this is what it can yield for understanding how AI systems are uh, producing social, economic, political, et cetera, impact. Um, at first, I just felt an absolute loss to be able to translate a lot of those questions and concerns um, back to my field sites, because just speaking from the Indian context without essentializing it, without saying, oh, it's because it's a developing country, um, I felt that going back there, um, none of the technological systems were so totalizing or had culminated fully in their design and implementation uh, for me to be able to immediately go out there and test or sort of interview people and say, what's the impact of AI on your lives or how is it? Um, so even though there are systems being implemented, just as all the speakers said, in healthcare and public distribution of welfare, in governance, et cetera, they are still both somewhere at nascent stages, but also happening through this intense process of negotiation, right? And an ongoing process of infrastructuring. Uh, so within that in process of infrastructuring, within decisions being taken around, what kind of vendors are going to get these contracts? Uh, what kind of terms are being set and what is written in those tenders? Um, and all the language, all the, these are all the small steps that are in fact so crucial and important to perhaps anticipating um, what might finally become the form of that particular AI system or that interface. So that was definitely a challenge that I had to overcome in the sense that uh, when I go to study AI in the field or AI on the ground, I am most often just looking at digitization processes. And I kind of like, resonate with what Vidushi was talking about in the sense that most recently I was doing some preliminary research again around public records and police station activity to be able to sort of arrive at a broader understanding of what might happen a few years down the line. And there wasn't anything magical or there isn't even anything sort of hidden and secret, at least for me, that is going on that, that I feel like some of the more uh, popular works on AI and social impact seem to suggest, although they may not want to, uh, is that, oh, we went somewhere and we found this egregious sort of discrimination ongoing. Um, the, the places where I was looking for AI and what AI is doing are often very mundane places where there's a lot of um, scope for also accidents. There's a lot of personal politics, as um, organizational politics at play. Um, so that was definitely a thing that I had to start attending to and get out of the AI hype or even the word AI and say anything and everything can potentially feed into understanding the impact of AI systems in the future. So that's something definitely I want to keep in mind and talk about more. And relatedly, the other thing is that um, I feel like if one is studying AI implementation in the public domain in some way, or even when companies are building software, um, it has led to a sort of reshuffling of the pipeline um, in terms of which actors become more important or which actors become less important uh, in the design of these systems. So when it comes to, you know, say Aadhaar, um, the biometric system, or when, when it comes to healthcare or public distribution of welfare, um, there are all these so-called sort of boring, mundane characters uh, within this pipeline of creation that at least I wasn't paying attention to, to begin with. You know, perhaps anthropologists of uh, bureaucracy or government um, are, are more primed to looking at these things, right? Saying that what role does a pun or a clerk or a, a scenographer sitting in a particular government office play? What kind of information are they privy to? Uh, what more can they tell you apart from what you're reading in the tender and, and reading into the tender, can they give you a different narrative? Can they attend to the absences or to the deliberate obfuscation of information that you actually want to gain as an ethnographer? So how does one engage with a variety of these actors in the field? Um, how does one build alliances again, right? Which is, uh, again, such an important issue. 
And something that I'm still very much struggling with and I don't really have answers to is um, that within the more critical AI community, there seems to be um, an urgent pressing imperative to discuss uh, our ethics and our ethical positionalities and roles, which I get, which I understand. But at the same time, that conception of ethics for me puts me in a position where negotiating access and maintaining access to a government office, to a corporation, to, or being embedded as, say, a user experience researcher within one of the big tech corporations, which is the only way that you can get some of this information, makes it really tricky to uh, simply say that, you know, I, I this is true, but, but I have to still do this. I feel like that we have to find more real, more practical, authentic ways to talk about how um, access is indeed very privileged, but at the same time, it's not mystified. It's not a matter of uh, having having the skill or having the right kind of approach to be able to gain access, right? That there are limitations to how or what an ethnographer can do despite their best skills and intentions. And a lot of that is also a political decision or, or even appears as an ethical and moral decision in terms of where you decide to embed yourself to be able to access the knowledge that you want. Uh, so that's an open question for me. I'm going to stop here um, and just invite whoever's watching us from the audience if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to send them over on Slido. Uh, we can take a three to four minute break. We'll all be on Zoom, but we'll just mute and wait while you gather your thoughts and offer us questions. Um, and then we can have a panel discussion and, and have everyone speak. Also, if folks want to take a water break, etc., please feel free to do so right now. Uh, great. If everyone is back, can I just ask all the speakers to switch on their video and uh, unmute themselves? Okay, so we do have quite a few questions, and I just want to make sure that we have the time to discuss them all. Since uh, they are in the order of presentations, Radhika, do you want to go first? I can, I can either read them out to you, or I can read, read them out for everyone, actually. Um, so the first question is, when doing field work, how do you all tackle research ethics requirements that were created in and for the US context? For example, this is Aswata and she says, I'm having trouble convincing my research participants, that is police personnel in Chennai, to sign any consent paperwork, though they're otherwise fully willing to talk to me. Thank you so much for the question. Um, it's really relatable, very relatable, because uh, as I mentioned, even in my intervention, this is something that I also have faced a lot of problems with. So I think there's a colonial hangover in that sense, uh, where ethics review committees, even in India, have these same requirements. Um, so what I have done or what has worked for me is making connections with localized or other union workers in that area. Uh, because people trust them because they are from that same space. And therefore, if they accompany you, 
then by extension people are also able to trust you because people don't really trust the form no matter what the consent form says people trust people and i think that is why when i mentioned earlier in my intervention that's what i meant by the formalization of consent through form is not a very feminist way of understanding consent and i'd like us to move towards a method of doing research where we can get consent without formalizing it through forms um i also don't think this is a very radical idea because if you think of consent and how it works in everyday interactions including sexual interactions you don't actually require a formalized consent form for ethically carrying out these activities so i think feminists have really thought about this for a long time and some of those lessons should be applied to even the way we are doing research for example exactly how that would look like what would the challenges of that be is something i am myself thinking through but these are my initial thoughts um, and some work around for that for now i hope that helps hey dushi do you also want to respond since your work was directly with police persons yeah i was just thinking about the time that i got um, a letter signed and then i wasn't given the letter <laughs> like they signed the letter and kept it with them um which is just peak bureaucracy but i think um it's uh, i i resonate with what you said radhika in terms of like people trusting people in the new delhi case for instance i am not from delhi so you can tell with my hindi for instance that i am not from delhi um but my co-author shivangi was from delhi and she was able to forge connections that i wouldn't have necessarily been able to do and that really helped us in you know getting into the building having conversations you know over chai and things like that so i think um prioritizing human connection um is something that can't be overstated enough and to give you an example i mean we tried to do research on smart lamp posts in singapore um and we you know we had all the paperwork ready we had all of the people from govtech we had an excel sheet we did all of the things that you could do to be well prepared to do um interviews and it was just it it didn't happen and i think it's it A, a lot of it is because of, we were outsiders right we didn't they had no reason to talk to us and they had no reason to trust us i think being really mindful of that and aware of your positionality is is um i think crucial um to to actually getting access in a meaningful way um i want to quickly jump a question and just uh, pose the next question to ranjit and then anyone else can answer which is uh amy chen has asked um how have you uh, how have you each approached maintaining a working relationship versus being critical of institutions while studying up i personally worked before with org that i might not 100% agree with as a partner or consultant but not as a critical researcher and i'm curious what may be different i'm just going to tag on to their question and also pose back to all of you guys that do you make professional decisions based on some of these considerations i think uh, i look at it from the perspective of uh, you know how do we actually make conversations happen so you know even if i would not agree with a position of a person uh, i would really like to engage with them at a level where they can actually understand what other people who are actually are a part of the same conversation uh are saying so you know one of the things that i continuously have tried to do over my research has been to be in conversation with the designers of the biometric project as well as people such as the right to food activists and then carry and do the work of translation more or less where i carry the concerns that you know the activists have to the designers and i carry the responses of the designers back to uh, the activists as a way of you know because what you're doing primarily uh are two simultaneous things one is as a researcher the objective is to be able to translate uh some of the findings into you know a broader conception of how we actually need to think about these systems and you know uh be able to actually connect across uh, disciplines and domains and at the other level it's you know when when it becomes something that you personally simply cannot stand then it's a completely different question but at the same time uh you know taking one step back from the situation always helps because you know uh, i always keep my translation hat, uh, hat on so for me it kind of it's easier to ne uh, negotiate some of these challenges uh radhika vidushi do you want to chime in uh 
Um, I can go first, just in, in the interest of time. Um, this is something I struggle with a lot, especially being a woman in a law enforcement institution in India. Like, I mean, we needed to use the restroom one day and we realized there wasn't a woman's restroom on the floor. We were on, so it, it, was, um, it was a daily kind of struggle to, the balance between biting your tongue and saying something keeping your translator hat on, but also, you know, being a human at the end of it was something that I really struggled with. I think um, the way in which I, I kind of came around that or, you know, at least attempted to fix that was to be as transparent as possible. Um, just because, you know, it can feel quite extractive if you're in an institution and you're studying the institution, but you're not really telling them what you're doing. Mm. Um, and so it was, um, I think the, the balance between biting my tongue and saying something, I, I chose to say things um, when I when I thought that they wouldn't really hurt the the the, the wider work that we were doing, um, and and that I actually think that it's it's held me in pretty good stead regardless of context, whether it's Delhi or you know Singapore or or, or any of any of the jurisdictions that I spoke about. Um, but I will say that keeping the translate translator hat on is something that I want to get better at so Ranjit I think like learning from you might be on high on my list in the future um, because I think it is it is challenging right like you're 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 deconstructing human interactions and human um, ways of functioning alongside technology and you have to be a human as well so it's it's a bit of a challenge I'm going to quickly take one more question and Radhika can go first if she wants to answer it. Since ethnographic researchers are involved in the finding in finding the experience of people with technology and end up building trust in the community, can they play an active role in educating people about technology and its use for their safety? And I want to turn it around a little bit and in fact ask you guys that some of the things we discussed around access or building trust and then not feeling like you're tricking people that you don't agree with just to get data out of them. Do you think any of these issues can be made less acrimonious uh, with this use of education or awareness? Or did it ever happen within your context that you had a real conversation with, say, police persons or other like tech bros or whoever it was, and, and they managed to really understand why the work you do is important and hence it became a different relationship, one of probably knowledge and not like extractive uh, research. I think this is a really great question. I really like this question. Um, and maybe this is the activist in me speaking, but I definitely think that advocacy is a really important part of research, um, which means that when you're going into even conceptualize the research, at that stage, I think of how there can be community advocacy that you can do around it. And that does not just have to be educational, though that's an important part of it, uh, but it can also just be involving the people in the activities that you, are the, that you are doing. Often we stay in touch with them and if a lot of them often have like funding issues that we try to send them proposals, their ratings that might help them in the future. And I personally reject the professional personal uh, sort of binary that exists. So I've actually become really close friends with some of the people who I initially met in the field as research participants. Um, and I think that that is also a feminist way of doing research. Um, and it, I think, also kind of responds a little bit to the previous question of how we maintain those uh, relationships. But uh, I definitely think that at the stage of conceptualization of the research proposal is when one uh, must also think about how one can give back to the communities that we're speaking to and do community advocacy that would help them. I think very quickly, one way of uh, thinking about this problem is uh, to think about, uh, you know, uh, in the back end, my team is also watching this and they kind of came up with this idea of thinking about methods by prop uh, preposition. So, you know, uh, rather than thinking about just studying up or studying down, there is a way by which we can think about studying up, uh, studying with, studying against, studying between, which kind of then opens up the space of thinking about how, what these relationships that we are building with each other are, and how to a certain extent each of these prepositions allows us to do something else with the relationship as well as what we can gather from it. That's, that's a great way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, I just want to add to it, and I guess I, I want to say that um, 
in a very crude way, I've definitely felt, I, I don't have answers for it, but I've definitely felt a lot of discomfort and guilt when um, I'm not actively trying to harm or create troubles for people who just go about doing their jobs uh, within a larger system and, and for making space for their aspirations or their visions of what they also want to build in this, whether they're right or wrong, or whether I agree with them or disagree with them. But to hold that in balance with the larger picture that one wants to communicate about what's going on at a systemic level is, is a very, very difficult uh, position that we all occupy. Uh, we are out of time and we did have more questions. Um, I guess I can copy paste them to the speakers and we can definitely continue this conversation um, to whoever is watching us speak. This is so weird. Um, you can always get in touch uh, with us on Twitter. All of us exist on email, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So we're happy to share that information with you. Thank you so much.